Chapter 9, Another Trial Corrin ends the Ice Tribe's rebellion. Upon returning home, new orders are issued. Conquer Notre Sages. But first, the team must pass through Fort Dragonfall. Your Majesty. Hmm. Of course. Yes. Thank you. Everything's okay. Yes. However... Insolent fool! Don't worry yourself. What? Listen well. Hmm. Enough. Listen well.
not fail me. Yes. <laughs> hmm. Poor thing. You'll be all right. You know it. Listen. Understood. I see. Thank you. Good luck. Please, be careful. Understood. With our 10,000 gold from Chapter 8, we've done a bit of shopping. We now have a full set of bronze weapons, including a spare axe and a second lance. But our biggest expense so far is the new Nosferatu tome that we have bought for Odin. In Chapter 8, we had to babysit Odin a lot, giving him frequent healing and keeping him under the protection of Lily's poise and demoiselle. Now he can heal himself, so he's a lot less needy. We are still going to give him aura support, more or less constantly, but now that's mainly to maximize experience and minimize spending on tonics, not because he absolutely needs it. Another important addition is our javelin, which both Silas and Effie can use. We only have one, so they'll have to share. At one point, Silas will need to have enough speed to double archers. That's why he's been given a speed tonic. We also bought a defense tonic for Odin, and we gave Effie the HP tonic we had saved from Chapter 5. Also, Azura is back, and she's under our control right from the start of the mission. She's trapped behind enemy lines, and her Naginata has been taken from her and placed in a chest. Luckily, she has a key to open that chest and get her weapon back. The only enemy standing in her way is a single underleveled samurai who patrols around the eastern part of the map. 
Azura will have to avoid him until she can re-equip herself. There is a dragon vein up in this corner. It's meant for Azura to use. As our army moves deeper into the fort, she can cripple several enemies with acid rain. But we're not going to use this. It's kind of far out of our way. Another item of interest is this second treasure chest. This one contains one of only two rescue rods obtainable in Conquest. Hitaka is the leader of the Hoshidan forces here. He has high stats, and he has a couple of good skills. Seal Defense is native to his Spearfighter class, but Rally Defense is a level 5 skill for Wyvern Lords. He can use it to buff his allies, although that won't be too much of an issue because we're going to fight his archer friends with magic. Stronger Post is a mercenary skill that increases his damage when counterattacking, making him difficult to wear down with chip damage. He's an interesting guy, especially because we can capture him. Once again we face a single enemy staff user. This Shrine Maiden has an Enfeeble staff, which inflicts a 4 point debuff on every stat. The point of Flora's free staff was to make it hard to go places. Enfeeble is designed to kill you. There are multiple entrances to this fortress. The main one is guarded by a group of spear fighters and archers, but if you don't want to deal with those, you have two other options. You can go the long way around to reach a breakable wall on the north side of Fort Dragonfall, giving you easy access to the rescue chest, and the fastest route is another breakable wall on the south side. Near that southern entrance, there is an allied unit, Nyx. Korn can talk to her, and if he does, she'll join the team. So our plan will be for Korn and Silas to go east right away, recruiting Nyx as quickly as possible. Meanwhile, the rest of the squad will storm the front gates. Working together, they should be able to handle the guards there. How very annoying. I'm with you. Together we shall prevail. Since Silas is holding our javelin, the only characters left who can counterattack spear fighters and archers simultaneously are Odin with his tomes and Arthur with his hand axe. Everyone else aligns to support them. Elise can sit right between the two boys. Neither archer can reach her, so she's safe. You have my support. I'll protect you. Well... Pass. Huh? 
Listen, child. What? I'm not looking for trouble, but... Oh! No. What? Yes. This is Nyx. Like Odin, she is a dark mage, but stat-wise, she's the opposite of Odin in just about every respect. That means she has great magic and speed, and she has fairly good resistance, but every other stat is horrible. Nyx's personal skill is mostly inconsequential. It counters incoming magical attacks, but resistance is Nyx's only respectable defensive stat, and she doesn't have a lot of HP to spare, so you can't easily engineer situations where counter curse can deal a ton of damage. One funny thing about it is that when an enemy dies directly from Counter Curse, Nyx does not get credit for the kill, so she can sometimes steal experience from herself. Nyx benefits from a relatively high starting level that makes her almost ready to promote. And with a promotion, Nyx easily meets the stat thresholds required to one round a lot of enemies in the next few chapters. So you can look at Nyx and think that because she's easy to promote and her offensive stats will meet the kill benchmarks, she's a pretty good unit. However, if you dig a little deeper, you might notice that in the upcoming chapters, the jobs that Nyx is best at are actually pretty easy. The targets for which she is best suited are ones that a lot of other characters can also handle just fine, usually without having to promote. Whether you promote her early or not, Nyx always works as a fast mage with high magic who can kill things on player phase. Except that her abysmal skill and luck stats ruin her accuracy, making her frustratingly unreliable in that role. Heartseeker can't always salvage things because Nyx doesn't have the bulk needed to absorb hits at melee range. So my expectation is that for this challenge, Nyx will be the hardest character to train. Don't take that as a complete condemnation, though. Nyx's base stats are still genuinely useful, she can give nice parrot bonuses to a magic building partner, and if you want to play favorites, she has access to some very fun toys through her heart, friendship, and partner class sets. One thing we want Nyx to do later is to one round at least one archer. At base, she's not quite powerful enough to do that with fire, and she's not fast enough with Fimblefetter, but Thunder gets the job done. We've put Corn in range of these paired up samurai. Our Corn is very fast, but they have a blistering 19 speed, which is enough to double him anyway, not for the lead samurai, who is inhibited by his steel katana, but rather for the one in back, who has an iron weapon with no follow-up speed penalty. The AI can and will switch the positions of paired up units to maximize damage. It knows that hitting twice for 8 damage each is better than hitting once for 11. And we're happy to take 8 times 2 because the second hit on Korn should activate Vow of Friendship. Over at the front doors, it's 6 on 5, and that makes things simple. Let's make this fun. 
I won't let you down. Not bad, I guess. In the name of justice! When's my turn? The darkness whispers. We don't need any healing from Felicia, so she can spend her turn earning some dagger experience. The chosen hero will rise! I'll let a bell hand! Strength is everything! Shut up and skill! Well fought. It'll work out. We can do this together. <laughs> I am genuinely astounded at how much defense Elise has. She might even match Baruka before Baruka ever shows up. So excited! Uh -oh. What now? <laughs> My darkness was darker than yours! We can do this. Let's go. Right now, we are rooting for the enemy. We want them to hit. No survivors. Ah! How unfortunate! Ah! Two things should happen now. For one, Nick should get the kill on the lead samurai using Corrin support. Enemies who are paired up are worth more experience, and we want Nick to get a decent chunk of XP on this map. Second, Silas needs to reach level 10 right now. Because of the level difference, Silas will only get 8 experience for dealing the killing blow with a dual strike, and that's not quite enough. Instead, he'll have to take the kill himself. Technically, it would have been better if Korn had missed his counterattack a moment ago. Then Silas could have hit the lead samurai for 9 XP, Nyx could kill him, and then Korn could kill the second samurai using Silas's dual strike. That would have generated more experience overall, but we'll just have to be satisfied with this magnificent level. At level 10, Cavaliers learn Shelter. The Shelter command does reverse pair up. Instead of making you pair up with your teammate, it makes your teammate pair up with you. Shelter can be used to, well, shelter people, but it can also be used for some more advanced movement tech. We'll see a little demo of that later. It'll be fine! Let's give him hell. You are not alone! I'll crush them! Let me help! Stand down, fiend! We can do this. Corn has nothing to do, so he just waits. You'll be alright. Before we go any further, our main army is going to reunite, and Felicia will patch up most of our wounds. Check out my skills! Let's go! We have no choice. Nyx can separate Korn from Felicia and put him in a useful position. She wants to earn support with both Korn and Niles, but her opportunities to do that will be limited, especially with Korn. Nick should fight with them or next to them whenever possible. In this situation, the idea is that Odin will bait one archer toward the southwest corner of Hitaka's room. Then Nyx will be able to kill that archer from the tile above Korn. Now that Effie has transferred Niles to Elise, Nyx can take Niles from Elise before she kills the archer. Elise will need to borrow Arthur's hand axe in a moment, so he gives it to her now.
The Shrine Maiden will be able to enfeeble Odin, making him take a lot more damage from the incoming attacks. We didn't have to play it this way. The Maiden's enfeeble range is longer than the attack range of her teammates. Because of that, there are several tiles you can stand on where you can bait enfeeble and wait it out without ever being in danger. That's a perfectly legitimate strategy, but it's kind of boring. I'm going to use other methods to limit the impact of the enfeeble staff. With a speed boost from Niles, Nyx can double the archer. However, we don't want her to take damage at all, so she needs to hit the first time. We'll be okay, right? Now that Elise is gone, Nyx has only 16 attack with fire. The archers have 3 resistance naturally, so she hits for 13 damage but Yumi provide a resistance buff, making her deal only 11 damage per hit to the archer who has a steel one. 11 times 2 is just 22, which is one short of the amount needed to kill. And that's good. We definitely don't want Nyx to kill either archer on the counterattack, because then the second archer would have a chance to hit her again for lethal damage. You are in good hands! What should we do? Felicia can heal Odin back to full, but this is a bad spot for her. Everything Silas bails her out with shelter. I'll do my best. It's Corin who we want paired with Silas, not Felicia. That way, Silas can stack a vow of friendship with Supportive. And Effie's the one who will need the javelin. If Effie drops Felicia to the left, then Felicia will be in a safe position, and she'll cover both Odin and Silas with her Demoselle aura. Silas now benefits from four different skills that collectively increase his damage output by eight points and reduce the damage he takes by seven. And now we should talk about how staff targeting works. Anyone who plays this game will probably notice that the AI likes to use offensive staves on people who can be attacked by the staff user's teammates. On that basis, you could at least guess that the Shrine Maiden is going to enfeeble Nyx, Odin, Silas, or Effie. And you would be right, she is going to target one of those four. But that's not exactly why. The AI actually counts how many teammates can attack each target. For Nyx, that number is two. Two archers could theoretically hit her. For Odin, the number also appears to be two, the same two archers. Silas is in range of five enemies, three spear fighters, one samurai, and one archer. And Effie can only be attacked by one archer. Silas prevents the spear fighters and samurai from reaching her. However, when the AI counts the number of attackers it can bring to bear against us, it considers each of our units in isolation, ignoring every other player-controlled unit on the map. So, when it's doing this calculation, the only restrictions it sees on pathing are from the terrain on the map. It's completely unaware of other units that might be in the way. In this case, that means the AI does not realize Silas is shielding Effie from several attackers. So let's think again about the units the AI might want to enfeeble. Silas is the easiest to consider because our naive count where we only check the enemies who really can attack him was accurate. But with Effie, well, the exact same spear fighters and samurai who can reach Silas can reach her too, at least in theory so her attacker count is also 5. That's not all. Three of the four melee units who can reach Silas and Effie also think they can go to the square west of Silas, where they can hit Odin or Felicia, and the southeastern archer could also attack Odin or Felicia if he could stand on Silas's tile. So along with the two archers near Hitaka, Odin's count is 6, Felicia's is 4. That makes Odin the new leader, which would suggest that he will be the target. However, as a way of maximizing the debuff value of Enfeeble, the AI is programmed not to use it again on the same target until the effects have completely worn off. That takes Odin out of the running. The last candidate is Nyx. Like Silas, her initial count was correct. The only two enemies who could theoretically reach her right now are the archers on the other side of the wall. 
So, based on these criteria, Odin is out. The next best and feeble candidates are Silas and Effie, who each face five attackers. The tiebreaker is accuracy. The AI wants to have the best possible chance of hitting with Enfeeble, so it looks for whichever target has lower staff avoid. The avoid formula against Dave's is the target's luck plus three times their resistance, all divided by two, rounded down. To determine who will be targeted, we only have to check the numerators. For Silas, that's three times seven plus 12, which is 33. For Effie, we get three times four plus 10, which is 22. So Effie's staff avoid is worse. That means she will be the target, and given that Effie is really only vulnerable to a single archer, we can be sure that she and Silas will both be safe. I want to give a special shout out to the users Skepti and Firepop Wasteflower Snow Moon on Mecha's Discord server. They did a bunch of testing with me and discovered a lot of these rules. We'll wrap up our turn by putting Arthur next to Nyx to increase her hit rate by 4. And lastly, we have Azura. Because she gained a point of strength when she leveled up in Chapter 5, she deals 7 damage to the patrolling samurai, killing him in 3 hits. The samurai can also kill her in 3 hits, but if Azura strikes first, she should be fine. The nice thing about the Shining Bow here is that it reduces the user's avoid, so Elise's dual strike is reasonably accurate. Odin and Niles are ultimately going to acquire a supports with other people, so we don't have to unlock their supports with each other, but we'd still like to do that, if only for the extra bonuses they can get in the meantime. Let's make this <laughs> Too much power! With Niles in back, Odin gets a movement boost that will allow him to run all the way to the Shrine Maiden. On this enemy phase, she won't enfeeble us because she'll be busy healing the wounded Spearfighter, and then on our next turn, we'll be able to kill her. We want Nyx to unlock a C support with Niles after this map, but we'd also like her to get two thirds of the way there with Corrin. She already has the necessary support points with Corrin, but because she and Odin have been adjacent for four battles now, Odin is threatening to pass Corrin, knocking him down to third place. That means Nyx has to avoid Odin for the rest of the mission. We put Arthur to her left last turn so that she could still get a hit bonus from one adjacent ally right now. Even with his defense sealed, Silas will be able to absorb two hits, since one will get blocked by Korn. I'm here to help. Not a chance. Evil 
shall not prevail. Arthur will need his hand axe again in a moment. When finishing off the spear fighter, he chooses to use Effie's support over Elise's to make sure his support points work out correctly. He and Effie didn't earn any support at all with each other in Chapter 8, so on this map, they need to get all three support points required for their B support. I'll protect you. Ha -ha! Um, shall we? Felicia uses Silas's dual strike to kill the archer. And because she has that C support with Silas now, she's guaranteed to use his dual strike on enemy phase rather than Arthur's. It doesn't matter much, but it's nice to have that consistency. Thank you very much. We need each other. Rest in peace. If we're going to take down the Shrine Maiden, we need to muscle through the Spear Fighter pair first. Let us join our strength! Well fought! It'll be fine! We can do this together! Ha! This one's for you! Live to Serve makes it so that healing staves will restore the same amount of HP to the user as they do to their target. This is a very useful skill on your first servant just because of the roll compression it provides. It's a big reason why you don't need two separate healers early on. We have no choice. Together we shall prevail. I guess I can't be mad about getting more magic. The chosen hero if you want to pursue a strategy where you change both Elise and your servant into classes that don't have staves, the most convenient replacement for healing duty is this Shrine Maiden. We'll capture her with Niles. Capture attempts incur a 10 point hit penalty, so this is less reliable than just killing her outright. I've had better. The level 1 prison can hold two people, so we'll have room for one more captive. Now that we've entered this area outside Hitaka's room, we've triggered a bunch of reinforcements. On our next turn, we'll face four spear fighters from the northern stairs, three archers from the eastern stairs, and two samurai from the southern stairs. It's possible to block the reinforcements by standing on their spawn points, but we won't need to do that, and it would be counterproductive if we did. Unfortunately, upon reaching level 10, Arthur learns Gamble. This is the worst skill in the game. It decreases your hit rate by 10 to increase your crit rate by 10. That's a horrible trade. The consistency represented by 10 points of accuracy is far more valuable than the extra chance to deal triple damage. We will remove this skill as soon as we can. My power is at your service. Nyx has a small chance to miss. We'd like to mitigate that by making Effie equip a stronger lance that can allow her to pick up the kill anyway, but the math doesn't quite work out. I'll be your shield! Ah. 
Instead of killing the wounded spearfighter right away, Lee should take Odin and drop him in a position where he can be more effective next turn. He's not doing much standing behind Arthur, and in fact he prevents Arthur from killing the spearfighter using Elise's dual strike. Elise also needs the hand axe again. From this position, Odin can reach the archers who are about to emerge from the southeast. We want the spearfighter to attack him and die, giving Odin and Elise some more experience. Generally speaking, we would have to worry about whether that spearfighter would see a kill on Arthur, because if he did, he would try for it. Since Arthur gained a bit of HP and defense before this mission, he was always going to be fun, and he dodged an attack on turn 1, making those concerns moot anyway. If he hadn't, Lily's poise would be the thing saving Arthur from death. We can do this! Arthur and Odin each only needed a 1 point dual strike to secure this kill, so from their standpoint, it would have been better for Elise to equip the Bronze Axe. But Elise also needed to be able to kill the Spear Fighter if he attacked her. Arthur's dual strike would have hit for 5 damage, and with her Bronze Axe, Elise would have only dealt 6, leaving the enemy with 1 HP. We can't kill all 9 of these reinforcements on player phase, but we can certainly reduce their numbers a bit. The most important targets are the archers, since most of our characters cannot fight them effectively on enemy phase. This is where Silas's speed tonic comes in. Over the last couple of turns, Niles and Nyx have amassed enough guard points to max out their gauge after one more attack. That means Nyx can attack the archers safely even at a range where they can counter her. The Thunder Tome she got from Corrin gives her the might she needs to kill. We could have attacked this archer from just one space away instead, but we need to pull our entire team away from the spear fighters and samurai, and we want most of our units to be unpaired at the end of this turn, if possible. That means we have to cram a lot of people into a small space. Putting Nyx on the stairs, but having her attack the left-hand archer, is the best way to accomplish that. At level 10, Nyx has not only had some fantastic growths, but also unlocked a new skill. We've seen Malefic Aura before. It's basically a straight plus 2 damage buff for Nyx, but Odin can also take advantage of it. Because Nyx killed the left-hand archer, Odin can now occupy that space. We want to kill the last archer with Odin's attack, followed by Elise's attack, plus Odin's dual strike. If Odin were to use Nosferatu, he would deal 15 damage, and then Elise would immediately kill the archer with 9 damage from her hand axe, preventing Odin's dual strike from going off. So for his first attack, Odin uses fire instead. Now Odin will be able to dual strike for the kill, and there's no reason why he shouldn't use Nosferatu for his dual strike. Before singing, Azura gives Odin her fresh vulnerary. Once she refreshes him, he can set up for enemy phase. Ugh, my aching blood! It's better to use the fresh healing items first. You can distribute two partially used vulneraries among two separate units if need be. Odin made Elise equip her bronze axe rather than her hand axe because of this Bolt Naginata spear fighter. That's pretty counterintuitive, since she can only counter this guy with the Hand Axe. But the Hand Axe makes her vulnerable to follow-up attacks, reducing her effective speed by 5. The Bolt Naginata Spear Fighter would double her. Now, because of the way the AI prioritizes its movements and how it always sets up for dual strikes when possible, Elise is going to be completely safe from that Bolt Naginata. The Spear Fighter will attack Odin across the wall instead. Felicia takes Niles and then separates. We always want to separate people who are not about to be involved in combat because that will let them perform two actions on our next player phase, not just one. And in this position, Felicia once again covers both Odin and Silas with her aura. This samurai has 21 listed attack, while Silas has only 2 HP and 8 listed defense. The effective seal defense still lingers. 
However, Silas is currently getting 10 points of damage reduction. 3 from Vow of Friendship, 2 from Supportive, 3 from Lily's Poise, and 2 from Demoiselle. In total, combining his 2 HP with his 18 effective defense, Silas can withstand a physical attack of up to 19 power. Although this samurai nominally hits for 21, two of those 21 points come from his weapon rank, and those don't count when he's on the wrong end of the weapon triangle, so this samurai can only deal one damage to Silas. There's no actual danger to Silas anyway because his guard gauge is full, but the AI isn't aware of that. If the samurai could deal just one more point of damage, he would try to attack Silas. We don't want that, we'd rather have him go for Odin, giving Elise another chance to build Axe Rank. Arthur can get out of danger by pairing up with Effie, who can move away from the Spear Fighters. The Samurai double her, but she one-shots them in return with her Iron Lance, so she'll be fine as long as she heals herself. The kill is exact, so if Effie had gotten fewer than 2 points of strength in her 3 levels so far, we would have had to give her a tonic. I'll protect you! Again, we want the right-hand samurai to attack Odin, so Effie needs to let him pass. We can do this together. You are in good hands. No hands. Stay back. Because of Duelist's blow, Nice is only slightly more likely to hit than not. Kind of like Horn on turn 2, it's technically better if she misses. Niles just tries to get some chip damage on this spear fighter. Even though bows have an advantage against lances, Niles' accuracy was pretty bad. That's because this spear fighter has a dual Nagidata. The special effect of these dual weapons is that they reverse the weapon triangle and double its effects, so instead of having an advantage, Niles had double disadvantage. Elise has the same problem. On the other hand, our Tome and Sword users get bonuses when they would normally have penalties. We can improve Elise's accuracy against the dual Naginata guy by applying Nyx's Heartseeker. And while she's there, she can take out the other Spear Fighter using Niles' support. Now Elise's hit rates are much better, even when she's attacking solo. And if she uses Odin's Dual Strike, which has perfect accuracy because of the reverse weapon advantage, she's guaranteed to deal some damage. Let me help. You are not alone. I was here first. Before we finish off that Spear Fighter, we should consider the other enemies. We want Felicia to kill the samurai, but not when she's adjacent to Silas, because Silas and Effie will unlock their C support as long as Silas and Felicia don't get any more support points with each other. However, in general, Felicia needs to use somebody's dual strike to kill that samurai. Under the circumstances, she'd have to team up with Elise. That means we would need Silas to move away first, and that's what we're doing. We can already see how bad Gamble is. Without it, Arthur would have 96% accuracy. Instead, he has to settle for 86. We won't give up. Just, uh, 
justice prevails! We've got As I was saying, Felicia usually needs backup in the form of a dual strike to get this kill. Most of the time, Elise will have missed her previous dual strike, or Odin and Felicia won't have gained enough magic and strength for Felicia's attack to kill by itself. But as it happens, Felicia doesn't really need Elise's help. If Elise had missed this samurai the first time, then she'd be getting another pointed axe experience, and because her dual strike would deal the killing blow, she'd be getting a few more experience points than she did. My aching blood! You, uh, passed your test. Remain calm. Fate is cruel. Before we battle Hitaka and seize his throne, we have to open up the second treasure chest. We're going to use another AI manipulating setup to do that. Let's make this fun. Evil shall not prevail. I'll do my best. We'll be okay. Here we go. Niles is the only person who could open the chest. If he were to just walk over and do that, the archer would attack him, he would counterattack, and then the spear fighter would hit him again at melee range. And that would be annoying, since we would be facing a healthy spear fighter in a slightly awkward position. With Arthur supporting him, Niles has enough attack power using his iron bow to kill the archer in a single round of combat. That makes the situation a bit better. Still, we can earn even more experience and support points by not one-rounding the archer. Instead, we want to give that archer someone else to attack, someone who can't kill him on a counterattack. Odin is the man for the job. When selecting targets, the AI always prefers not to die, so the archer would rather attack Odin than Niles, even though that means he will box out the spear fighter. Now we can easily weaken the spear fighter by shooting over the wall. This should be quick. You are a good hit. Your end draws in. What should we do? Let's do this! Our slight sandbagging of Niles has given Effie an opportunity to take the archer kill for herself. If she also defeats the spear fighter, she'll reach level 10. And Niles should reach level 10 anyway because he's going to get the boss kill. In the name of justice! <laughs> what a workout!
Odin and Elise are the ones who are going to engage Hitaka first. Heartseeker is a very useful tool to mitigate the avoid bonus from the throne Hitaka is sitting on, and Odin is much better equipped to apply that on enemy phase than Nyx is. Nyx just makes Effie equip her most accurate lance. We can do this. Okay, let's go. Another way to reduce Hitaka's evasiveness is with the free staff. But we'd rather not burn one of these just to support a single round of combat on enemy phase. We'd prefer to have it for our next player phase, when we'll try to hit Itaka several times. The obvious way to use shelter is to pull teammates out of danger, but its most powerful application is in sheltering Azura specifically. Once Azura has been sheltered, another teammate can take Azura and switch to her, whereupon she can sing again. So by sheltering Azura, you can refresh multiple units in a single turn. Effie's growths haven't been all that impressive. Until now. We've just learned two new skills. Elise got Lunge, which is an alternative to the attack command that makes the user switch places with their target after battle. This is a pretty amazing tool in the right circumstances, but it'll be a while before it really does anything, and unfortunately you can't use it to pull stationary bosses off of their thrones. Effie unlocked Natural Cover. This makes her even bulkier when she's on any tile that has an effect, such as Stairs, which have an Avoid bonus. It's a good skill, but there aren't a ton of main story maps in Conquest where terrain is a prominent feature, so Natural Cover isn't always as useful as you might hope. It does work on flying units though, and flyers can use it more easily than ground units can. We've got trouble! Felicia heals Elise so that Elise can fight Hitaka one more time. Let's go. <laughs> whoa, whoa. Now we do want Felicia to cast Freeze. Having gained exactly zero strength so far, Elise can't deal any damage when dual striking with a bronze axe. She has to use the iron one instead, and that has somewhat worse accuracy. Remember, she doesn't benefit from Odin's Heartseeker skill when Odin is the unit currently acting. Silas shelters Azura so that we can execute a double refresh that will allow Effie to reach the boss. I can do this. Let's leave no survivors. Let's do this. With the benefit of Arthur's support, Elise is stronger, and she can switch to the Bronze Axe.
fate's accomplice. <laughs> no hands, stay ah! back. <laughs> Such a tease. Niles can't hurt Hitaka by himself, but Arthur gives him the strength he needs to pull off this capture attempt. Hitaka dropped another heart seal, so now we can reclass someone else in addition to Elise. Or I suppose we could also make Elise a troubadour again. And Niles earned his own level 10 skill, Movement Plus 1. This skill grants Movement Plus 1. With it, Niles' movement stat increases by 1. It is the duty of our fearless leader to reclaim this fortress in the name of Nor. Hooray! Azura and Felicia aside, our whole team is already level 10, and we still have two entire training maps ahead of us. I'm so sorry. No. Hey. Yeah. Thank you. Azura? Next time, we'll do our first paralogue. Our roster is bigger than the number of deployment slots, so, with heavy hearts, we will have to bench someone.